as we uh, get ready for another great weekend of college football. Let me, uh, let me highlight the fact that my friend Rex Nelson is here, and this is the great legendary battle of Washita and Henderson in the Battle of the Ravine this weekend in Arkadelphia. So I hope everybody, uh, one of Arkansas's great rivalries. Uh, could I please ask if everyone would turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off? And I want to thank our volunteers and uh, for all the help they give us on these programs. Josh Visnell is a Clinton School student who's going to introduce our speaker. He's a graduate of Central Michigan University, and he played two years of college football at His Hillsdale College, Hillsdale College, a Division II school in Michigan. He interned with the Detroit Lions, and he coached at the University of Cincinnati's youth summer camp. He's worked with AmeriCorps on neighborhood uh, revitalization and restoration in New Orleans. And at the Clinton School, he's working with a group called Our Vets, identifying the health needs of rural veterans in Arkansas. Please welcome Josh Bisnell. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming out. Um, on behalf of the Clinton School, I am proud to be able to introduce our speaker. Um, like Dean Rutherford said, I was fortunate enough to call myself a student athlete for two years um, and participate in college football. And a lot of that is um, in reflection of who I am today. So I have a lot to owe to college football and the sport. So I look forward in hearing Mr. Ingrassi talk about the history and to kind of allude to where we are today with college football. Um, so. Mr. Ingrassi, like uh, Mr. Rutherford has mentioned, um, is a, an associate history professor from Middle Tennessee State University. And his book is called The Rise of Gridiron University. And we will get to it. And I will let you guys hear him talk. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, <clears throat> title of the book is The Rise of Gridiron University, Higher Education's Uneasy Alliance with Big Time Football. And today I would like to start out by quoting a recent critic of big time intercollegiate football. <clears throat> this critic uh, concerned about spinal injuries as well as football's uh, potential to corrupt college life, observed that the sports popularity has led some universities conduct themselves in a manner unbecoming of institutions of higher education. He said, and I quote, the public has pushed its influence inside the college walls, thus making it impossible for faculties or for the clean and healthy masses of the students to keep athletics honest and rightly related to a sane university life. End quote. So this critic's implication is clear. America's universities need to do something to rein in this beast before it takes over our universities and ultimately ruins higher education altogether. Now, of course, I stretched the meaning of recent a little bit with this quotation because the critic was actually Frederick Jackson Turner, who was a University of Wisconsin professor about 100 years ago, and he was actually speaking at a 1906 alumni banquet in Madison, February 1906. <laughs> Nevertheless, I would say that Turner's century-old critique is instructive, and I think its echoes are still with us today. On a weekly, I would say even some in this time of year, a daily basis, we're bombarded with reminders of football's excesses and its dangers. So a talented student athlete suffers a broken neck and paralysis um, in an early season game on the road. Players at a Big Ten powerhouse program pawn their trophies or their rings for tattoos or cash while their coach looks on silently in his immaculate sweater vest complete with the embroidered Nike swoosh logo. And elsewhere, a legendary coach with a reputation for instilling discipline on the athletic field, raising millions for the university library is fired after a six decade long career when it's discovered that he apparently ignored or possibly tried to cover up allegations of sexual uh, molestation by one of his defense or by his defensive coordinator. So if we look at the historical record, we start to see that many of the problems college football deals with today are by no means new problems. Today, I will discuss the origins of football, the controversies surrounding late 1800s and early 1900s intercollegiate athletics, and the reforms that were proposed and some of the reforms that were created at that time. And I'll also invite us to think a little bit about some of the ideas behind this, th those reforms, as well as some of their long-term effects, some of which I think we're still dealing with um, today. 
So the research for the book took me all over the country over a course of several years. I examined sources like newspapers and popular magazines, academic journals from the time period, as well as archival manuscript collections generated by people like university presidents, professors, football coaches. Uh, many of the collections I examined were, are housed at private universities like Harvard or Yale or Stanford, but also, also a lot of public universities, places like Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, Georgia Tech, and Atlanta. One of the big questions I kept asking myself as I was doing the research and writing the book was this, how did we get here? How did Americans end up with universities that sponsor and orchestrate um, massive athletic spectacles? And I would say the answer is actually pretty complex, but it's a complexity that looking at the historical record actually does help us um, untangle a little bit. First of all, football was the first big time intercollegiate sport. Today we have football and basketball and various other sports. Football is where it all started out. <clears throat> Football emerged in the industrial era of the late 1800s. So this was in the decades between the Civil War and World War I. This was a time when America's universities, just like America's cities and corporations at the time, um, were growing dramatically. It was no longer enough to teach a few students in a cloistered atmosphere, like some of the small, what we call denominational colleges of the common in the pre-Civil War era. But in this industrial era, universities needed to teach large numbers of students, uh, young men, as well as in many of these universities by the 1890s, young women uh, also. They, they were teaching them the knowledge and skills they would need to contribute to the modern economy of a modern society. As these universities grew larger and larger in scope, they created new departments and specialized fields, specialized disciplines, uh, like say political science, history, uh, sociology, psychology, biology, chemistry. We could keep going on and on with some of these new departments created at this time. Some students in turn started to complain that it was all too much. Their minds were being stuffed full of information. They would soon be so top heavy with, heavy with knowledge that they would even suffer from uh, what they called nervous exhaustion or the, the medical term at the time was norasthenia. No longer a, a, an actual diagnosis, but at the time it was very common. Students needed some sort of recreation, this is what they're saying, that would provide balance. Many Many started to, turning to football as their game of choice. So we usually say that the first intercollegiate football game was played between Princeton and Rutgers in November 1869. It was actually 143 years ago this week that what we call the first football game was played in uh, uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. By the 1870s, Harvard and other schools in New England, such as Tufts and Yale, were playing rugby, which had actually come to America by way of Canadian universities, especially McGill. So that first game at, between Princeton and Rutgers was not actually, it was not what we call football, it wasn't even rugby, it was kind of a disorganized kicking game. But in the early 1880s, a Yale student named Walter Camp started turning rugby into what we today consider American football. First thing he did is he eliminated some of the disorder from rugby uh, by allowing players to set the ball down on the ground and thus start play over again periodically throughout the game. Uh, this is the way, in this way, the scrum was transformed, the scrum of rugby was transformed into the scrimmage of American football. Then other changes followed. Players had to move the ball a certain number of yards in order for their team to maintain possession of the ball. Used to be it was five yards in any direction, which kind of boggles people's minds today. But today it's 10 yards forward, right? But at this time it was five yards in any direction. So this is where downs and yard measurements originated. Camp even introduced timing to the game. This is a new idea that you actually time a game um, at this, uh, in the 1800s. So football, in short, was becoming what we might call a rational sport. And we shouldn't be surprised that after dropping out of Yale Medical School, Camp went to work for a clock company in New York City, and he later became the president of the New Haven Clock Company, which was at that time the fourth largest timepiece manufacturer in the United States. So he not only created rational sport, or at least helped to help to create rational sport, but he was also an industrialist and a rational manager. And in his spare time then, Camp served as the unpaid, unofficial coach of the Yale football squad, which was then one of America's best. In fact, until just a few years ago, Yale was still the winningest um, college football program in, in football history. And at this time, football was exclusively a collegiate game. Professional football really didn't emerge until after the First World War in the 1920s. That's when the NFL actually was created. And in the book, I argue that in order to understand early football, you have to understand the higher education, the colleges, the universities of the time. In the late 1800s, America's universities were growing dramatically in size. I mean, nothing like what happened after World War II, but, but growing uh, substantially to thousands of students, whereas before it was common for a, a, a large university, university to maybe have a few hundred students. 
Unlike the small pre-Civil War colleges, they were be becoming more specialized, they were becoming more focused on research. The same way that the division of labor, uh, rationalization were taking over in industry, they were also taking over in higher education as well. So once upon a time, knowledge had been something that was passed from generation to generation. Truth was based on deduction, it was based on close reading of divinely inspired texts, things that were seen as inherently truthful. But what happens in the late 1800s is that knowledge was being created incrementally. Truth was being apprehended through inductive methods, especially through scientific observation of the natural world or of human society. So at this time, universities were hiring highly trained specialists to do research and teach in ever smaller pieces of intellectual um, territory. And in the meantime, advances in transportation and communication technology allowed these specialists in far-flung locations to communicate their findings with one another. So a professor at Harvard can easily speak to a professor, can, can uh, uh, correspond with a pr professor at the University of Chicago or something like that. So what's happening is that, you know, sometimes we talk about the economy economies of scale that were developing in America by the late 1800s, but we also might think of some of what we might, might call the academies of scale that universities were developing in the late 1800s. So this is where the title of the book actually comes from, called The Rise of Gridiron University. So universities started to embrace a game played on an orderly field called a gridiron. That's because of all the lines when they measure the, the, the uh, for downs and so forth. But they were also developing a kind of scholarship that relied upon networks of scholars and networks of disciplinary specialists. So universities created expansive networks of scholarship that stretched throughout the country, but they also created expansive networks of intercollegiate athletics at the same time. In this brave new world of higher education and scientific truth seeking, they had to compete with each other for resources, for students, for those academic specialists who were gonna teach the classes, produce the research, um, things like that. They also had to compete for public attention. By the turn of the century, many professors and administrators said that sport was one way to do this. You wanna get the public's attention? Well sponsor a sport that people are going to be excited about, they're going to come to campus, they're going to see, um, they're going to see uh, universities up close in a way that they might not in other cases. For example, uh, in the early 1900s, the president of the University of Illinois was Edmund James, and he said in one of his speeches that he claimed one-sixth of the taxpayers of Illinois didn't know much at all about the university. And he said, well, if we had a, a successful football program, if we make sure that we, we keep our football program out there, this maybe is gonna help tie together the many disciplines, the departments of the university. He also says it's going to lead to some public exposure. Those taxpayers in Illinois will know about the university. They'll wanna, you know, uh, have the state legislature uh, um, subscribe appropriations for the university. So that's his solution to um, making the university more visible. Now, sport might bring about public exposure or create a sense of unity on campus, but we have to remember that it could also be very dangerous, or it might be in some ways debilitate, debilitating for the universities that were supposed to be providing the knowledge and the graduates that would help push American society forward in a time period that we now refer to as the progressive era, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And what was actually happening by the 1890s is that a number of controversies were starting to sully college football and cause widespread public concern about the sport. First of all, many players were being injured on the field. One of the most famous uh, injuries and deaths actually was the, the case of Richard, uh, he was called Von Gammon, a University of Georgia player who actually fractured his spine in a, a game against uh, the University of Virginia that was played in Atlanta before 5,000 spectators in 1897. There was a huge hue and cry. The ministers of Atlanta said, we need to end this, this vile game before it destroys our society. And the state of Georgia actually nearly banned college football that year in 1897, but finally uh, there was kind of a repenting. The governor actually decided that he, he would veto the legislation. He said football was too manly of a game. We can't give up this game that really helps train our young men for uh, a, a society of, of urban competition, of uh, factories and warfare and things like that. Besides physical injuries, there were also issues regarding ringers and eligibility. Um, 
uh, problems. So-called tramp athletes were basically migrant laborers who would move around from school to school. They would play for whomever would pay them the most money. If you think about it, what was happening at this time is that the purity of American universities were actually at stake. It wasn't just college sports that was people were concerned about. They were actually concerned about the universities themselves. How could the public trust universities if they appeared to have no admission standards and they let anybody in who would be able to play football? Could universities really succeed in their mission to, to, to enrich American society through the production, the dissemination of knowledge, the teaching of students in a progressive era if they were letting this seemingly corrupt athletic spectacle take over campus? Things got especially bad in 1905, so 107 years ago, uh, right about this time of year. That fall, 18 young men died on football fields around the country. Now, most of those were actually high school students. 15 of the 18 were high school students, but whenever people talked about it in the newspapers or in the media, it was always a college problem, not necessarily a high school problem. Several muckraking uh, articles were published in middle class magazines like Collier's, McClure's, other magazines. Some of them even suggested that the sport be abolished. They should actually get rid of college football. But I would stress that most of those who were actually in a position to make a difference didn't want to abolish football. They wanted to reform the game. They wanted to uh, continue it and its supposed benefits for America's uh, young men is what they, they especially were saying. One of the most surprising things I found in my research was actually the number of professors who actually wrote things that were very positive about sport. Professors in fields like psychology, the social sciences. Um, during the first decade of the 1900s, professors wrote pieces in popular middle class magazines, but also academic journals, even like the American Journal of Psychology. There were articles about football, its benefits, uh, things like that. And they discussed the things that were good about football. For example, on the one hand, you have psychologists who are stressing that football, as long as it was properly regulated so that it didn't cause injuries, they said that it could actually be beneficial for students' central nervous systems. They said it would be better for the nerves, for the brain, um, for their, uh, um, their spinal cord, so forth. They said this is actually going to help make America's young men, uh, put them in better shape so that they will be able to withstand the rigors of a modern economy, of modern education, things like that. I mean, we have to keep in mind that a common phrase that people used at this time was, uh, it was a Latin uh, slogan, mens sana incorpore sana, which would mean a sound mind and a sound body. In order to have a sound mind, you have to have a sound body within which that mind is, is contained. Now, on the other hand, so psychologists are saying this, social scientists also wanted to save football, but they tended to focus on students' morality. So it's not about the nervous system, it's about the morals of students. They argued that properly regulated football could actually help students develop the strong morals that they would need in a large-scale urban industrial society. So by learning how to follow the rules, play in a very disciplined manner, they would, the social scientists would say, student athletes could learn how not to play to the crowd, play for themselves, play to the rules of the game, and thus avoid the vast array of temptations that would face them later on in modern life. We can come back to whether or not that actually is the case, but that's what they were saying in around 1905. So although many people discussed football reform, the most famous of those was President uh, Theodore Roosevelt, actually. Traditionally, and I'll, I'll put the emphasis here on traditionally, sport historians have stressed Teddy Roosevelt's role in saving football, but I would actually say that his role was a, a fairly minor one. He played an important role, but he wasn't, it wasn't like one day Teddy Roosevelt said we need to save football and it got saved. That's not exactly the way it happened. There are some books out there that say that, and I, I'm not sure I agree with them. But in October of that year, TR called representatives from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, what they then called the Big Three. Those were the most famous football programs in the United States at that time. He called them to the White House, and he told them, he said, you need to clean up football. You need to do something before the public. There's a huge public outcry and we have to get rid of this important um, game. But Roosevelt's mandate isn't what really led to football reform. Rather, there was a particularly violent day in late November 1905, it was right around Thanksgiving, when a Union College player named Harold Moore actually died of a cerebral hemorrhage in a game against uh, NYU, New York University. Subsequently, subsequently, after this game, Henry McCracken, who was the chancellor of New York University, he called for a national convention to discuss the future of college football. McCracken pointed out that if the universities of Germany, these were the world's best universities in the late 1800s, not American universities, it was the German universities. He said that 
nobody would take them seriously anymore if, if they held their famous uh, fraternity sword duels in big stadiums and charged admission and everybody would see the students at the German universities cutting their faces, each other's faces with swords. He says, we would never take the German universities seriously. Can anyone take American universities seriously if we host this bloodthirsty sport on campus, charge people uh, money to, to see the game and then celebrate it? He said, we need to make sure that actually we're being taken seriously as institutions of higher education. McCracken's call for a national convention did result then in a convention held in New York City right after New Year's Day, 1906. When representatives from a number of different universities gathered there in New York, they had in mind those ideas about student morality, student health, how to fix football. These reformers wanted to fix the game so that it would benefit education, not actually be corrupting universities. Ultimately, the delegates to that convention did create what they called the Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States, which later, about 1910, came to be known as the National Collegiate Athletic Association. That's present-day NCAA. Now, I always tell my students that this organization is so typical of the uh, organizations of the progressive era. If you want to solve a big national problem, you create a big national organization. If you want to fix the problems of uh, intercollegiate football, you, fix the N you, you form the NCAA. If you want to solve the problems of race relations and lynching and things like that, you form the NAACP. If you want to eliminate child labor, you form the National Child Labor Committee. NCAA is one of, one of many of those groups that are kind of where people are banding together to create big national um, solutions to these, to these big national problems. Now, the NC, NAAC, sorry, I even get them confused when I'm t talking to groups or to my students. Although the NCAA was not nearly as powerful in 1906 as it would become by the 1950s, it did suggest some reforms that many of its member institutions did then adopt. One of those suggestions, probably the most famous suggestion coming out of the early NCAA, was legalization of the forward pass. Before 1906, it was illegal to throw the ball down the field past the line of scrimmage. If you've ever seen an American football game, to think of the game without having the forward pass, it's almost unthinkable, right? It's, it's the, the, one of the defining characteristics of American football. Before 1906, not legal. After 1906, it was legal. Many reformers argued that the forward pass would make the game safer by making the play on the field more open. That's the term they always used. They said, well, this will open up the game. It'll make it safer. So players would be more spread out on the field. There would be fewer injuries, such as the ones that killed Von Gammon in 1897 or the injury that killed Harold Moore in 1905. Now, there were some reformers who said, actually, the forward pass is not going to make the game any safer. They said it might, in fact, make it more dangerous. Um, but what they did say is that, well, even if it doesn't make it safer for the, the nervous system, for brains and spines and so forth, they said, well, it will actually make the game more moral. Because what you're going to do is you're going to spread the players out on the field. It's going to be easier for the officials on the, field to, on the field to see if a player is breaking the rules, punching somebody when they're down on the ground or something. They said, well, it's going to be easier for the officials actually to enforce the rules of the game. And they even said that, well, when you've got tens of thousands of spectators in the stands, all of them will also be able to see what's going on and help the officials in the enforcing of the rules. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure this is what happened, but this is what they're saying in 1905, 1906 when they're proposing the forward pass. Now, I want us to think about this a second. Football reform, I would point out, resembled some of the other significant reforms that were being implemented in American life at this very same time. Think about meatpacking. 1905-1906, Upton Sinclair, a uh, socialist uh, muckraker, published a novel called The Jungle. Some of you have probably heard or at least or, or read parts of that, that book. Congress then in, in turn passed the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. Now these laws were designed to keep food and drugs pure in large part by making the process of producing them visible to the public. This is very similar to what was going on in football with the legalization of the forward pass. Everyone has to be able to see what's going on there on the field. So it's, it's about transparency. It's about public accountability. These are things that are essential to maintaining the purity of consumer goods and also university-sponsored athletic spectacle. You want to keep meat pure? Meat Inspection Act of 1906. You want to keep football pure? NCAA and the forward pass. The creation of the NCAA and the legalization of the forward pass were arguably the most significant, the, most, uh, the, the longest lasting reforms of post-1906 era. But I'd point out they weren't the only reforms 
in fact, to really understand football reform, we have to look at some of the reforms that didn't succeed, as well as some that were implemented in later years. I mean, sometimes it's very tempting to say, well, let's just look at the, how we got to where we are now. Sometimes we actually have to say, why didn't we end up with a different way of, of doing things? For example, universities on the West Coast had a much different idea about how to reform football in 1906. In spring 1906, right around March, uh, April of 1906, representatives from Stanford and the University of California uh, at Berkeley decided to replace American football with a different sport. They actually said, let's replace it with rugby. Let's go back to basics and, and have rugby. This was right after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake which did a great deal of damage to both the city of San Francisco and to Stanford's campus in, uh, in Palo Alto. Stanford was hit particularly hard by the earthquake. Officials from those universities saw this as a time of rebuilding. People throughout the Bay Area saw this as a time of rebuilding. So they decided to rebuild college athletics. So they got rid of the scrimmage, the downs, the yard measurements. They went back to rugby. Stanford and Cal even brought in players from uh, Britain's Pacific Rim Imperial Territories. So they're bringing in professional players from New Zealand and, and Vancouver and places to teach their students how to play this game. That they, these students haven't played rugby before. They've been playing football for years. So they, these universities even went on a crusade to try to get the rest of the country to follow their model. Um, Stanford's president, his name was David Starr Jordan. At this time, he was, he was very famous. I mean, he was akin to like a Woodrow Wilson type of figure. I'm sure Jordan would have loved to have been president of the United States. Wilson's the only university president from the time who actually did uh, make that jump. But David Starr Jordan actually wrote, uh, d uh, I think, hundreds of letters to university presidents around the country asking them to switch to rugby. So it, it was actually kind of comical the way he did it is he wrote a letter to the president of the University of Wisconsin and then he just made carbon copies and sent them out to other presidents. And if, when, you're, when I was in the archives I said, why are these, some of these presidents sending the letters back to Jordan? What I realized is that he actually forgot to inclu include a cover letter with this, this, this form letter that he just sent out. So some of the universities said, oh, got sent to the wrong president. I'm gonna send it back to Jordan. He maybe wasn't the smartest in, in that regard. Um, so a few of the schools actually expressed a lot of interest. Some of them said, well, there's nothing really we can do. We're in a conference or we joined the NCAA. Uh, but some of them are really taking this very seriously. There was even a Stanford psychology professor named Frank Angel who wrote a piece in a middle class periodical called The Outlook that extolled rugby's many virtues. He pointed out that even though rugby was a manly, a very vigorous game, he said, well, it's better than American football because it tends only to injure the arms and the legs. You, know, you play rugby, you might break an arm or a leg, but the chances that you're going to damage your, your central nervous system are much lower, fewer broken spines, concussions, things like that. So, Stanford and Cal ultimately were not able to turn the rest of the country to rugby, but they were able to convince universities in a few western states to switch to rugby. Um, California, I think Oregon, Nevada, Utah, a few other western states did actually switch um, to rugby. And rugby then was the dominant game on the west coast until about 1915. It was just before U.S. entry into World War I, right around the time of the 1915 San Francisco uh, World's Fair actually, when they went back to uh, American football. Back east, other reforms were taking hold in the 19-teens. One of these was the rise of professional coaching. At the 1909 annual NCAA meeting in New York, there was a Purdue University economist named Thomas F. Moran who gave a speech uh, explaining why professional coaching would actually improve football. Moran said that if coaches were hired on year-long contracts, similar to the way professors were hired, he said they would be much more invested in their universities. They would no longer be willing to jump from job to job just um, searching for uh, more money, more fame. Um, they really would be true professionals, he said, not just journeymen always looking out for, for an, uh, a quick buck. And therefore, they would be better able to teach morality, disciplined behavior to the players on the team. So he said this is going to clean up college football if you introduce professional coaching. Subsequently, by the 1920s, many universities did create athletic departments. They hired professional coaches. And some of those professional coaches actually wrote uh, what I would call didactic football manuals that often stressed just how good they were at teaching discipline to young men on the field or even to spectators in the stands. John Heisman wrote one of these books in 1922. Bill Roper of Princeton. Newt Rockne wrote one in 1925. It was probably ghost written, knowing what we know about uh, Newt Rockne's writings. But all 
all these, I mean, it became uh, virtually every coach, every famous coach wrote one of these, these books by, by the 1920s. And there's a lot of X's and O's, there's a lot of play diagrams, but they always start off by saying, we're doing such an exceptional job of teaching discipline in a way that professors can't do it, fathers can't do it, ministers can't do it. We're the ones who are teaching discipline to America's young men. Um, again, I'm not sure that's what was happening, that's what they were saying. Many of these coaches even became tenured professors at their universities, and this is something we don't think a lot about today. But up until the 1960s, it was actually very, very common for head football coaches to be tenured professors. I think Joe Paterno was actually tenured at Penn State. And this actually is something, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but that's something that stopped in the 1960s. What happened is there were especially some issues regarding civil rights and black power at places like the University of Wyoming. Some coaches did some really dumb things in relation to African American football players. And that's when a lot of universities said, okay, we're not gonna grant you tenure anymore, you're on your own. And that's about the time that coaches started jumping around from job to job, and their salaries went up dramatically. I mean, they were already high in the 1960s, but they went up into the hundreds of thousands and, and the millions by the 80s and 90s. Another reform, besides professional coaching, another reform that took off in the early decades of the 1900s was the building of massive concrete stadiums on university campuses. Believe it or not, the first large concrete structure of any type in the United States was Harvard Stadium, built at Soldiers Field in Boston, the Alston neighborhood of Boston in 1903. Subsequently then, Yale constructed the Yale Bowl in 1914. Schools like Princeton and Georgia Tech followed suit. By the 1920s, universities all around the country, especially many state-funded universities, uh, University of California, Illinois, Ohio State, Minnesota, um, they were uh, building these reinforced concrete behemoths on their campuses. And many of these big stadiums were dedicated as war memorials, World War I memorials, that's why you have so many memorial stadiums, or they were bu built for purposes of nationalism and even militarism in some cases. Uh, there were even some stadiums that weren't called memorial stadium that still memorial funds went into the building of them, or they said, we need to build the stadium in order so we can teach young men, basically, we can train young men how to, uh, well, to have good bodies and then be, to be able to ultimately fight for their nation if we do have another international war like World War I. I would point out, though, that even there's a, lot of, there's a lot of rhetoric about these being memorial stadiums, they were also places of consumerist spectacle designed to bring in revenue. Um, I mean, the talking points at, when the University of Illinois was selling its stadium to, uh, to donors, they said, well, the first thing you tell the donors is tell them that this is going to help student um, uh, student bodies, it's gonna make the students uh, better, um, they're gonna have better physique then as a result. Then you had to point out that there was actually gonna be an athletic field for all the students then surrounding the stadium. And if that didn't sell them, well then what you had to do is say, well, if you contribute money to the stadium, you'll be first in line to buy tickets next year when the stadium opens. So again, they're saying one thing, but there's something else going on there too. And con I would point out that concrete campus stadiums were seen as a reform because they were safer than the wooden stands that were common in the late 1800s. They're not gonna burn down, they're not gonna collapse, and they also projected the the image that the popular athletic spectacle of football was being controlled by the universities that, that were sponsoring it. Now, I would say this is the point where we can maybe step back and ask ourselves a few questions about some of these reforms. First, did the forward pass make football safer? Did it make it more moral? Possibly, I'm not entirely convinced. There are still, as we know, s serious injuries in football, especially as players get bigger and faster. Um, my own unscientific observation of football players and the crowds that watch them would seem to indicate that they're not always interested in morality. And, and <laughs> despite, despite the talk of good sportsmanship, that's not always in the game. But the forward pass did more than likely make the game more exciting for consumers. In this way, football reform was once again like meatpacking reform. Uh, Upton Sinclair often lamented that when he wrote The Jungle, he had aimed for Americans' hearts, uh, but he had actually made a mistake and he hit him in the stomach instead. And that's why we got you know, a, a, a consumer reform instead of reform for workers. The forward pass might have been, I would say, a similar phenomenon. It made the game more exciting for spectators. After all, it, it, the forward pass reintroduced an element of chance that had been lost when Walter Camp introduced um, timing and yard measurements and all those things in the 1880s. Uh, made football, he had made football into a much more scientific and rational game, but I would say that the forward pass may not have made football all that much safer or more moral. Second, we could ask ourselves, did the professionalization of coaching keep football from corrupting universities? 
Did it maintain the purity of higher education? Once again, I'm a little bit skeptical. Professional coaches, especially, again, those in the last 40 years or so, in an era where so few have been granted tenured positions, usually have no problem leaving their jobs for greater pay or fame uh, when they can do so at other universities. And I would say, judging from the, some of the scandals that have rocked programs like, say, Ohio State in recent years, it's dubious if they're really all that interested in teaching young men discipline. They seem a little bit more interested in winning games and earning revenue for their programs programs and for their universities. So to the trained and untrained eye alike, it appears as though coaches are out to win the games to bring in the revenue. Third, I would ask us, our, I would ask us uh, uh, did the building of campus stadiums help universities turn football into a carefully controlled spectacle that served educational purposes? Now, my argument in the book is that stadiums did not necessarily serve as spaces for what we might call a middle-brow culture. So that's something that bridges the gap between high-brow intellectual culture and low-brow popular culture. That's what people were saying then. It's going to kind of bring those aspects of society together. I would say that actually universities merely created permanent spaces on campus for popular culture, for popular spectacle. If you think about it, once spectators pay for their tickets, once they gain entrance to the arena, they are in a position to determine the meanings of collegiate sports. Professors, coaches, administrators, today the same way 100 years ago, they can claim any meanings they want for sport, but they're really no longer in control once they open up campus facilities to paying consumers who are not necessarily members of the university community. I actually contend this is why debates over mascots, such as some of the Native American mascots, this is why it's been so co contentious in recent years, because on the one hand, you've got social scientists and humanists who teach at universities who have a much different view of Native American culture than, than their counterparts in the 1920s when those Native American mascots were created. Um, and while those academics today would like to get rid of these anachronistic, these old-fashioned mascots, to many state residents or local townspeople, the stadium or the symbols uh, represent the team really belong to the public. They don't belong to the university. They belong to the people um, who, who uh, enjoy the sport. In the book, I even make the case that football was what I call the cultural cornerstone of America's ivory tower. The intellectual apparatus of modern America's research universities could not have been built without some kind of popular support or some kind of popular recognition. Athletics provided that popular appeal. If this is a case, then I would say that stadiums were the keystone. This is the architectural element that gave the structure of big time intercollegiate athletics strength and durability. All we have to do is look around us. Many stadiums built decades ago are still in use. Many of them are being renovated, expanded, uh, made more permanent, and virtually, um, and virtually all of them, like I said, have been expanded so that they can actually accommodate more spectators, earn more revenue for their universities. Excuse me. Finally, I would ask, what is the role of the NCAA in the 21st century? And in recent months and years, critics have assailed the NCAA for its apparent complicity in allowing universities and athletic conferences to exploit college athletes for publicity and for revenue. Uh, one of the most famous pieces in this regard was uh, uh, Taylor Branch's article on the NCAA that, that showed up in the Atlantic Monthly about a year ago. It was a little over a year ago, I think October of, of 2011. And his article, along with some others that have come out in the New Yorker and other magazines in the last couple of years, they remind me of the muckraking articles on football that appeared in the fall of 1905 in Collier's and McClure's and magazines like that. While I am not going to pass judgment on the NCAA here, uh, the way Branch and some others maybe have done so, I will give a little bit of historical perspective on the NCAA and some of those reforms. Something that we need to understand about the reformers of the early 1900s progressive era is that they were what we would call pragmatists. They were realists. They wanted to create practical solutions to the problems they were facing right then in their time. Even though they were pragmatists, they also sought permanence. They wanted to come up with long-lasting, even permanent solutions to these problems they were dealing with. I would point out, though, that pragmatism and permanence are not necessarily compatible goals. Does it make sense to devise a permanent solution to a problem that is unique to a particular time or a particular place? What if these solutions merely perpetuate the problem? Maybe if they just merely mitigate its effects rather than actually solving the problem uh, that people are facing? Now, I don't know if anyone is going to seriously entertain the idea that big time college athletics should be abolished. I'm not necessarily going to say that. I don't know if many other people here would say that. But I would point out that today, that isn't even a realistic um, option, even if anyone did want to do that. 
Besides the fact that hundreds of universities have athletic departments with big budgets, highly paid professional coaches, massive athletic facilities like reinforced concrete stadiums, the NCAA and the athletic conferences would never go for it. They could never allow this to happen. Uh, a large part of their job, and it has been their job for over a century now, is to conduct successful and even prof profitable intercollegiate athletics. So in closing, I'd like to take us back to Frederick Jackson Turner. A century ago, a little over a century ago, 1906, Turner was concerned about the rise of a popular yet potentially dangerous and corrupting spectacle at universities that were supposed to be in the vanguard of American progress. Remember, this is the progressive era, we call it that, uh, for a reason. They self-consciously saw themselves as wanting progress. And his critique still has resonance with us today because many of his concerns are still with us today. And I would say that in order to understand why we have big time college football in 2012, we need to know how college athletics became a permanent part of American life and American higher education in the early 1900s. And I would also say that we need to realize that it's possible that we may need to shape a new set of reforms for a new century and a new set of historical circumstances. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. There's a story, Brian, about a person who went to uh, see somebody in Alabama and walked into the home and the person said, son, there's one thing we need you to know, that there, there are two really important issues in Alabama. One's football and one's religion. And in Alabama, football is religion. <laughs> so, it, uh, big time college football, yes. Question right back here. Wait, the microphone, he'll get, she'll get you the microphone. Chris Clark from New York City. Hi. Wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, what, what do you, have you given any thought into market-oriented um, influences on reform uh, to, you know, of course, the, mm. the dangers of, of football? You've seen, you've seen a lot of studies in the, in, in the current media about the NFL, NFL Players Association mm -hmm. uh, donating a lot of money to uh, researching the current dangers mm -hmm. as caused by concussions mm -hmm. and a lot of the suicides that have happened to former yeah. players lately. Uh, but on the high school level, schools are being sued. Um, insurance policies are being tapped into for, mm -hmm. for, for uh, I guess, student athletes who are becoming paralyzed from the dangers of the game. Mm -hmm. Do you see that affecting reform efforts uh, today? So you say market-oriented, um, so in the sense of, of creating market incentives for programs to reform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a real potential for that to happen. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical of the idea that the market can solve all problems. Um, I, I mean, I, th I think that it's, it's probably, uh, it's necessary to have more kind of direct regulation, either through government or through um, um, uh, voluntary uh, organizations like, say, the NCAA. Um, I, I think those, those market-based um, incentives could make a big difference. I haven't spent a lot of time studying those uh, per se, though. Yes, sir. I had a couple of questions yeah. dealing with what you've yeah. been talking about based on some research I've done. Mm -hmm. One, you mentioned, you referenced the Black 14 at the University yeah. of Wyoming, because um, there was an Arkansan that was part of that. Okay. But how did the, what happened at Wyoming, Oregon State, and Washington, among other universities, mm -hmm influence the involvement, the, I guess you could say the metamorphosis of a coach in terms of the players and the university mm -hmm. relation. The second question, yeah. I follow University of North Dakota hockey, mm -hmm. and they've had the situation with the fight and sue mascot. Yeah. And I was wanting to get your thoughts on that, yeah. please. Well, I, that's a, two really good questions. And, and one of the things I think that's so important about the, the, the story of the Wyoming 14, what I said is that's really one of the kind of things that led to the um, universities being much more reluctant to, um, to grant coaches tenure um, because of what Eaton did there at, uh, at Wyoming. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure if... I'm not sure if I, I have any ideas about how it actually kind of shaped um, the figure of the coach. I mean, one thing that, that's really interesting about that story is that the, the coach was 
basically a celebrity. I mean, he was, he was probably more popular than any of the politicians in uh, Wyoming at that time. And it's just the university just didn't see, the trustees didn't see that they were in any position really to tell him what to do. And, and it was kind of seen as a, a privilege to play for this coach. And the, the public discourse at the time, the way it, it kind of came down to these black players was it was like, well, you've had this incredible opportunity to go to school and to play for this marvelous coach. You should just do whatever he says and not ever question it. And of course, the African-American athletes saw it in a different way, especially when all they were doing was just kind of silently protesting the fact that um, the BYU didn't have any black players, that the Mormon church was not, um, at that time at least, was not uh, offering full membership to African-Americans. Um, in the case of, um, remind me the, the second North question. Dakota. North Dakota. I'm more familiar with uh, the University of Illinois. That's actually where I, I did my PhD, um, which of course is Chief Illini Weck, which was just retired a couple of years ago. I mean, in, t in terms of uh, North Dakota, I mean, it's, it's controversial. I know that there's a, a major donor who has said, you know, I will take back my money or stop giving money if, if, uh, if, if the name is taken away. I think it's also complicated by the fact that there are multiple bands of the Sioux Native Americans. There's the Lakota and the Dakota. And I think one of them has said, well, it's OK if you call yourselves the Sioux. The other one has said, no, it's not OK. So you've got two different groups claiming that name Sue, who then are disagreeing over whether or not the university can use that. And I, in that sense, it's really fascinating because it gives us a window onto Native American um, law and policy today as well. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I saw a lot of this cl very close up at the University of Illinois. Um, and just you know, to give a little bit of perspective on myself, is I actually grew up in central Illinois, working class family. You know, my, my mom went to one year of college. My dad didn't go to college at all. My, out of my, my four grandparents, one went to a year of high school. And my grandfather signed his name with an X. You know? So I'm, I'm not from a, a well-educated family of professors or anything like that. And I'm thinking of my dad growing up. To my dad, I, I think that the University of Illinois football team and the basketball team, that was the University of Illinois. He didn't know anything else they did down in Champaign-Urbana. And so I think that probably in a place like, like North Dakota, that's, for a lot of people, that is a symbol. That's something they associate with. And they don't want it changed by these, you know, these eggheads over at the university who think they know better than the common people. Questions? Yes, Larisse. Would you address dual academic standards from the very beginning? Did you do anything about dual academic standards? Mm. Dual academics? Yeah, standards for athletes and the ordinary student. Okay. I'll give an example. Ten, taking a child to visit schools for mm -hmm. entrance, who's not an athlete, okay. uh, the entrance examiner said, you know there's a dual academic standard, mm -hmm. one for athletes and mm -hmm. another for ordinary mm -hmm. students. Did you deal with that at all? Not really. I mean, wh one of the things to, to keep in mind is that there, in the 1890s, at the, the period I'm looking at, there were very few regulations. I mean, and to the, to the extent that we have regulations today. Um, and. Uh, it was very common for somebody to enroll in, in the university or, or just play on the team and really not even be a student. Um, they would be given you know, fake jobs and things like that. So it, I guess what I'm trying to say is at the time I'm looking at, there really wasn't even a need for that kind of dual academic standard because the academic standards were so in flux and kind of being created at that time. Um, what happens later on is that as eligibility requirements are made uh, more strenuous, then there are ways that universities try to get around that. Um, you know, and I, I would say anecdotally, I've taught at three different Division I universities. Um, two of those I've taught, uh, well, all three I've taught student athletes, and, and at two I've, I've taught uh, football players. And there must be something like that going on because my, 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 a lot of my football players are just not not all of them. Some of them are very sharp and very good students, but some are just not well prepared at all for college. And, and something I was telling um, uh, the dean earlier uh, is that, um, I mean, basically, during, in the fall semester, they're, they're working a full-time job. I mean, this is, it's a 40-hour it's a week job. I don't know how they have time to do anything besides play football. And so I, I think, you know, like I said, I, I think we see that happening today. And I, I think it's, I mean, it's really unfortunate, but, you know, for these for these, a lot of these students, this is their only way, this might be their only shot of going to college, you know, so uh, it's, kind of a th it's kind of a thorny issue. To what extent uh, does a big time mm -hmm. college football yeah. affect 
either positively or negatively the overall mission of universities mm -hmm. in terms of education. You know, yeah. I understand your yeah. comments about identification, but yeah. the reality is that college football today is a source of major source of inter entertainment for a yeah. lot of people that don't really have any connection yeah. to and don't expect to have any yeah. connection to a particular university. Yeah. And I think I think what I would say is that in the time period I study, there was this perception that somehow it would kind of be this form of almost university extension, that it would bring people into the universities, people would understand better what universities were doing. I, I would also say that, you know, scholarship at the time was much different. I mean, you have psychologists and sociologists saying things that today we consider very racist, and this was their scholarship. You know, things about the hierarchy of white individual, white people over other people of other uh, races or colors, and uh, men being at a higher plane in evolutionary development than women. And I would say in some cases, it's almost like they saw football as kind of replicating or, or demonstrating some of those things that they were saying in their scholarship. And for them, I think they saw that the football field was this place where they could, they could kind of convey some of those ideas to the public. By the 1920s and 30s, when a lot of professors started to kind of go back and revise some of those ideas, they weren't in control anymore. So I guess that, that's a long, the way I'm coming at your question is to say that, um, there was this perception at that time that this would be a really beneficial thing. It would help universities reach out to the public. But ultimately what I think happened is that, like I said, universities basically created this space for popular culture, for entertainment, that isn't necessarily doing a lot of good for universities other than publicizing them and advertising them. And uh, personally, I think that the impact in, in many cases is negative more than it is uh, positive. Uh, but again, there is that sense that because of the way research has developed in the last 100 years or so, that universities are, are at least, to a certain extent, off. They're, they're not accessible to many of the common people. And this is the one place that kind of makes, the one thing that makes universities accessible, even if it's in kind of a superficial way. And um, I guess that's, there's something positive about that. But again, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical if that's, if that's a reason to sponsor this activity, that we should point out that a lot of times people say, well, sports is good because it brings in money to the universities. People have done research and they actually show that it's maybe 30 or 40 programs actually make money off of big time college sports. Most universities, like the one I teach at, probably, I, I, they don't publish the figures. I'm guessing they lose millions of dollars a year on sports. They don't tell you that, but, but there, a lot of schools actually lose money on it as opposed to making money. Georgia, Georgia makes money, but maybe not, um, you know, pick your other like uh, semi-obscure Division I program. I'd like you to speak just for a minute on, in your research, what you were seeing in correlations with what was going on mm -hmm. with uh, large events in the United States and mm -hmm. our society and how it reflected on the changes and the evolutions that was going on with uh, football as it was growing. And for mm -hmm. examples, you know, we went through two world wars. Yeah. Uh, we had the patriarch of the family that was out for three to five years. Mm -hmm. uh, went through the Great Depression yeah. a decade later, and then we had the so social evolutions yeah. in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, that's actually a really, a really great question. And one of the things I noticed, and this is something that actually historians for a long time were kind of wary to, to make this case that, oh, wars kind of transformed society. It was all about big, long-term, kind of gradual changes. But I, especially since September 11th, we've seen an, an increased focus on how these kind of traumatic events can, can can actually shape history, and, and I'd say especially the Civil War is one of those major turning points, World War I, World War II. World War I is the one I talk the most about in the book, um, but the fact that you have, what happens during World War I is when so many men are being um, drafted into the military that actually, what, when, when they do the physical on these young men, it's discovered they actually, many of them are not in very good shape. And people say, we need to do something to make sure that when we do have to fight a war that our men are in good shape. Football becomes the answer for some people. Again, this is when the big memorial stadiums are being built, um, millions of dollars being, being collected for these facilities that will you know, perpetuate the memory of the war, presumably create some kind of, uh, or you know, inspire young men to, to build their bodies for um, future service to the nation. Um, that's a really important moment. 
Uh, I would also say in the context of like World War II, I don't do as much with that, but that's actually the point at which we see, it's after World War II when the NCAA starts to become a much more powerful organization, in large part because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of eligibility and even uh, like point shaving scandals in the late 40s and early 50s, and a lot of that had to do with uh, you have so many veterans returning, and these are no longer 18-year-old kids straight out of high school. These are 23, 24-year-old guys who have played, uh, or they, I mean, they've, they've fought in war, and they're looking out for themselves, and they say, okay, where can I get the best deal, the most money, and they're jumping around from school to school looking for money, and that's actually a point at which the NCAA kind of steps in and creates more and more regulations and becomes the very powerful agency that it is today. Um, because when the, when the NCAA was first founded, it was much more of a, a, an advisory agency rather than a, a, an actual regulatory agency, and over time, especially after World War II, it became a much more um, powerful organization. Also, something as simple as, as helmets. I mean, you think of, of football helmets. Could you play football without helmets? Well, before World War I, there were no helmets to speak of. What players would do to stop from getting a concussion is they would grow their hair long, which is a really, I'm sure is a really terrible way to not get a concussion, especially if you've got a, some, some male pattern, pattern baldness going on, right? But after World War I, then you had the introdu introduction of leather helmets, and then later on, then more solid helmets introduced. So those are just a few examples of how those, those moments are incredible turning points for sport. Brian, we were talking about um, earlier about branding mm -hmm. and how colleges and universities have branded athletic symbols and names and so forth. And a college football player's mm -hmm. number, people will go to the University of Arkansas or Arkansas yeah. State University gift shop and buy a particular number yeah. because of that quarterback or, yeah. or running back. Should, should college athletes be paid? That's a great question. And what I think I would say, I mean, Taylor Branch has written extensively about this, and I think he has a really good analysis about, about this. And he makes the case, actually, that players should receive some additional form of payment beyond scholarships. And I used to be somebody who was very much in favor of amateur athletics and said, no, I don't think we should do that. I mean, I went to a Division three school for undergrads, so that's kind of my, my idea of what, what, a, you know, what, what college athletics should be like. But uh, not that I played myself, but I did go to a, a Division three school. And I used to be kind of very much in favor of amateur athletics, but I think it, it it doesn't take into account the realities of present day sport, uh, especially what we were saying is that a university might make millions and millions of dollars off of a, a player's performance, image, number, things like that. And then who, make, who gets the money out of it? It's the universities, it's the, the people who produce the jerseys and the hats and things, and also especially the coaches. I mean, there are coaches who make upwards of four or five million dollars a year basically off of the volunteer labor of student athletes. And this is a long, a long running discussion. This goes back to the 1920s where you had coaches who would, they were absolutely, they'd say absolutely amateur athletics. We can't have anything but amateur athletics because anything else would corrupt the game. But then they're making money not just as a coach, but the, as early as the 1920s, they're making money off of endorsements. Newt Rockne endorsed Studebaker. Um, Bob Zupke at the University of Illinois endorsed um, Rawlings Sporting Goods. I mean, you could look for many of these, these examples. And what would happen is then a player would kind of challenge him on it. When Red Grange dropped out of the University of Illinois after his junior year to go play for the Chicago Bears, first major football player in, what, 1923, 24, to actually leave college early to go play for the NFL, this was scandalous, and his coach was furious. He said, not only are you never gonna play for me again, you're never gonna graduate from the University of Illinois. I can't believe you've done this, that you've sold out, that you went to the NFL, period, let alone before you were actually done with school. And Red Grange said, well, coach, you get, played, you get paid for football, why can't I get paid for football? And Zupke is just furious, he says, no, it, it doesn't work that way. You only, you only get paid as a teacher of football, as a football mentor. And I think Red Grange noticed there was kind of a certain amount of hypocrisy in it, right? That his coach could make all this money shilling, you know, um, pads and footballs and things for Rawlings and getting paid as the coach of the University of Illinois football team, but that he couldn't make that own decision and actually make money um, for himself. And I think that, uh, going back to the, the original question is that I, I think it's only fair that if we're going to have this big time intercollegiate athletics that generates millions and millions of dollars that a lot of these, these players, especially who are coming from, many of them from very poor um, um, circumstances, that they should 
benefit some from this as well. And then one final question. A lot of these schools, Georgia that you mentioned, yeah. University of Arkansas, others, athletic departments actually make money. Yeah. Um, what do you say to students, faculty, staff, taxpayers, legislators, uh, who, whose dollars are subsidizing uh, an athletic program? Back to Paul's mm -hmm. question of, are there fringe benefits worth the substitution of dollars mm -hmm. in those? Because most athletic departments, if I'm not mistaken, don't make money. They're not self-sustaining. Yeah. What do you say to that? What do I say to the idea that... It's okay to subsidize athletics. Hmm. I mean, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not going to say it's not okay to. I, well, I think what I would say is that it's, in many cases, it's distracting us from what universities are there to do. I mean, there is that kind of element of outreach maybe that it does provide, but it, there's an element of distraction too. And I would, I would have us think about something like, uh, I think LSU, within the last couple of years, has just gutted some of their departments. They can't afford to have foreign language departments and philosophy departments. They've, they've actually seriously cut back some of those departments. At the same time, they're, what, number two, number three in football every year? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember the exact ranking this week, but they're doing great in football. They're packing Tiger Stadium every week, or every week they're home at least, but they can't afford to have you know, a full foreign languages department. And a lot of times, what I hear people say is, well, the athletic money is separate from the university money, right? And when I was at the University of Illinois, I remember a teaching in Lincoln Hall, which they're finally, re finally renovating at a cost of about $54 million. And there was one day, at, Lincoln Hall was in terrible shape, hadn't been renovated since 1913, I think, any kind of significant money put into it. And there was one day at the end of the semester where the, stu the Daily Illini, the student newspaper, on one page, they said, Lincoln Hall needs $54 million renovation because when students take their exams in the, a big auditorium, they don't have desks to write on. They have to, and they don't have enough actual working chairs. They have to sit in the, in the aisles and, and write, their, write their exams or whatever. And then on the back page of the Daily Alliance, I was, here's, here's the proposal for a new $60 million basketball arena. And I said, wait a minute, you can find $60 million for a new ba NBA style basketball arena, which they haven't built, but they were talking about it, but you can't find $54 million to renovate the biggest classroom building on campus that sees thousands of students every semester take classes there. And I said, you know, I bet if you got your athletic fundraisers on this and had them go talk to people and say, we need some money to renovate Lincoln Hall, I bet you could find that money. So again, I think what I would say is that there's, there's a certain element of distraction that goes on there um, that, uh, that maybe takes us away from kind of the central mission of what universities should and can be doing. A great gift, a great read. Come uh, get Rise of the Gridiron University signed. Let's welcome Brian.